through the water and when he parted the Red Sea? Do you know that the water lifted up his hands? That's how it parted. Do you know it says that in the book of Habakkuk? It says that the water lifted its hands unto God. When it parted, we look at God parted the water. But in Habakkuk, he said that the water lifted its hands and gave praise to God. And the children of Israel went through. That's in the book of Habakkuk, if you want to read that. Praise the Lord. Chapter 2. So all creation praises God. From the water to the trees, to all the animals. Let everything that hath bread praise the Lord. Y'all look beautiful today. Y'all praise the Lord. Lord, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for the opportunity to come out to your house. Lord, I thank you for putting your spirit within me. Thank you for saving me from sin. I thank you for dragging me out of that simple lifestyle and giving me a new life in you. I thank you for putting me in this church. I thank you for the people that you brought out this morning. God, I pray that your spirit be among us. I pray that there be angels in here. I pray that they just be a whole host of spiritual beings in here. And that we and them may join together and give you praise. I pray that you speak to me. I pray that each heart here is molded and shaken and ready for the words that you speak through my mouth. And I pray that they be your words, for my words can only give ears. But your words, the words are powerful. They save people, they heal people, they deliver people. They take people from out of the hall of Satan into your beautiful, precious, dark hand. Thank you, Lord, for another day of life. Thank you for saving me. In your son's name, I give you praise. Amen. I'm going to talk to you about sin today. What is sin? That's what I'm going to talk to you about. What is sin? Where did it originate from? Where did it come from? What's the effects of sin? What's the cure for sin? And will sin ever be destroyed? Those are the five things I want to talk to you today about sin. What is sin? The first thing we want to look at, it don't matter what I think or what you think. What matters is what God says. And God, in the book of John, 1 John, He tells us what sin is. 1 John 3 and 4, John gives a definition. I forgot to turn the thing on. Sorry, guys. Got carried away. Sad. Praise the Lord. <coughs> you know, if we get this excited here, you know, sometimes God, He comes up on me and I just want to shout. I just want to lift my hands. Sometimes He comes up on me and I just want to lay on my face with tears. If we can feel this much, the Bible says that we, He gave us the pledge. See, we're married to Christ, but He gave us the pledge. The Holy Spirit that comes inside of us, it's like the wedding ring. But praise God, we're getting ready to get married. If I just got the pledge, if I just got the down payment, imagine what it's going to be like when we finally get there. If we can feel good now and be full of the Spirit and be excited about the Lord in this so simple world and in a simple body, imagine how good it's going to be when sin is done away with and we stand before Him. As this righteous being that he made us before his Amen. Hallelujah. You think there'd be some shout there? I know they will. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now that we can see, this is what the Holy Spirit put on John to write what sin is. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. It's the transgress the law. What's the law? The law is the 613th commandment that God gave to Moses. That's what the law is. The law is the commandments of God. What is sin? Sin is something that offends God. Sin is something that offends His righteousness. It's something that goes against His commandments. And I talked to you just a minute about it. Well, I, I get on that in a minute. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But that's what sin is. Here's the thing. In your life, whenever you commit a sin, that's how you commit a sin. It's whenever you break a commandment of the living God. Anytime you break a commandment of the living God, that's when you commit a sin. You may not know all the commandments of God, but the Bible says if you think something sinful in your heart, if you go against it, even if it isn't a commandment, it's sin to you just because you think it's wrong. Sin is when you deliberately do something wrong, when you go against the commandment of the living God. Now I want to talk to you for a second about where did sin come from? This is a real deep study. I ain't got time to spend as much time with it maybe as I should. 
But I believe you all got your thinking caps on today. And uh, I believe I, I, the Lord blessed me with enough time to show you enough about where sin originated from. And it's simple. It originated with Satan. Let's look at this. Let's talk about Satan. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanships of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day thou was created. Let's talk about how Satan was arrayed. He was arrayed with these nine precious stones. He was arrayed with gold. These pipes here are musical instruments. It says these musical instruments was created in him, prepared in him. He was a worship leader. This is Satan who was talking about. Now, this, this verse here throws a mental bridge in a lot of people's beliefs because look what it says. He's in the Eden, the garden of God, dressed this way. You go back to Genesis and read, you find that Satan coming into the serpent. Right here he's clothed with nine precious stones and he's singing praises to God in the garden of Eden. That's a different teacher, though. Okay? But this is the devil. Look what it says. Thou art the anointed cherub. What's, the, what's a cherub? A cherub is a four or a six winged angel. So he's talking about him being clothed with nine precious stones, him being clothed with gold, and him being this four to six winged angel that covered. What does that mean to cover? What's he covering? If you remember when God set up the tabernacle and the temple, that there was a mercy seat, and God said he would dwell above the mercy seat, but what was there? There was two angels, and he said to make the angels' wings cover the mercy seat. And there was called the cherubims that cover, and there was made of gold. And it said that Satan was the anointed cherub that cover. So my guess is the Ark of the Covenant that was in heaven, Satan was one of them right there by God. Right there, God dwelling between him and another angel. Who knows, the other angel may have been Michael. I don't know. But I know that Satan wasn't an anointed cherub to cover. And if you read the book of Exodus, when God told him to make this, he says, make the cherub and make their wings to cover the mercy seat. And it says it that way, and then it calls him the anointed cherub to cover. So Satan was a very, very high angel. He was a magician angel. And he was in the Garden of Eden with nine precious stones, giving praise to God at one time. And he said, I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God, talking about Mount Zion. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created, and to iniquity or sin was found in thee. Satan was absolutely a perfect being without sin until one day sin was found in him. He was close to God. No doubt his wings probably helped cover the mercy seat at certain times. At certain times he was clothed with these nine precious stones. He walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He sang praises to God, and then iniquity was found in him. Let's see what happened. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O cover and cherub, from the midst of the stone of fire. And look what it says in verse 17. Thy heart was lifted up. Why? Because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of what? Thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So how did Satan sin? His own beauty. He looked at his own beauty. <coughs> He quit looking at God and he started looking at self. Whenever Peter, who was a professional fisherman, who was, had a fishing business, and he lived on the lake or the river, uh, sea, whatever you want to call it, all his life, when the storm came upon him, he could not do nothing. The storm was greater than his abilities. And here he is a master boatsman, master fisherman. The storm was greater than his ability. And then what happened right when he thought he was going to die, here come Jesus walking on the water. And now the problem Satan quit looking at the Lord. He started looking at self. Satan so was corrupted by his own beauty and his own pride. <coughs> and what did it say happened? Satan's so heart was lifted up. Pride. So what happened? He looked at his own self, showing he lust with his eyes. What did he lust after? His own body. And what did it do? It caused pride in his life. You know, every sin you commit is one of these three sins. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 that there's only three sins in the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And these are not of the fathers, but they're of the world. They're of the devil. 
Every sin you commit, you'll commit with your eyes, you'll commit with a lust, or you'll commit with pride. But here's the thing. You cannot commit none of them sins until you quit looking at the Lord. What happens when you quit looking at the Lord? Doubt is formed. Every sin has a root, which is doubt. The Bible says in Romans 14, that which is not of faith is sin. What's the opposite of faith? Doubt. What creates doubt? Quit looking at Jesus. It's hard to doubt anything in this Bible when you're looking at the cross. It's hard to doubt anything in the Word of God when you're looking into heaven. It's hard to doubt anything about this Bible whenever you're not of this world. But if you're of this world, then man, it's hard to receive them promises in your life. When you're focused on wife, kids, when you're focused on the world, when you're focused on job, house, four-wheeler, motorcycle, when you're focused on looking on all them things and you ain't looking on Jesus, then it's easy to doubt and it's easy to Praise the Lord. We need to look on Jesus so that when the waves don't bother us. So the problem that we think was going to take our life, it can be under our feet. It's only when we quit looking at Jesus that our problems become problems at all. Your problems are under your feet if you look at Him. Praise the Lord. Satan was lifted up in pride. I ain't going to uh, take time to turn there because i got a lot of other verses I might use in a little while. But you can read this in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15 if you want to go there. And he's talking about Lucifer. He says, How thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, notice that God read his heart, for thou hast said in thy heart, thou shalt ascend above the heights of the clouds, thou shalt ascend above the stars, and to the congregations in the south of the north, and thou shalt be like the most high God. That's what Satan said in his heart. What happened? He quit looking at God, he started looking at self, and he got lifted up in pride of how bright I am, how beautiful I am, and then he said, I want to be God. And then he wanted to sin about God's throne. So, where did sin originate? It originated with Satan. Whenever Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what happened? You can only impute to somebody what you have. What I mean by impute, let's just say, for example, you've got some kind of sickness. And you go to the doctor and he has it cured. But he cannot cure you until he imputes the medicine to you. He'll take the needle and impute it into your body. And he'll squeeze the medicine in and it'll cure you. Okay? Well, the Bible teaches us that Adam was imputed with sin. What happened? When in the garden, God says, I said before you all these trees. And I said before you a tree of life. He said, but there's one tree in this garden, a tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And when they ate of that tree, Satan imputed them that eating of the tree was the breaking of God's commandment. What is sin? The transgression of the law, the transgression of God's commandment. God said, don't do it. When they did it, Satan imputed them three sins. Why them three? Because that's all he had. Now, every sin you commit, you can commit a million different sins, a million different ways, but it'll fall in them three categories lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and it'll have a root of blood. You wouldn't look at Jesus and you look And that's what I was trying to reach him for. What's the effects of sin? That's the next thing I want to look at. What, what, what effects does sin have? Let's think a minute about the power of sin. And you've heard me say this before. How powerful is sin? Think about God creating day one. He created light. Day two, He created the heavens. Day three, He created plant life. Day four, He created the fowl and the fish. I mean, He just, every day He creates something and He says it is good. He creates something else the next day He does good. He creates something else the next day is good. And finally, after the end of the week, He said, Behold, it's very good. He created the sun, the moon, the stars. He created the fish, the fowl. He created the cattle. He created the creep of the land, the creep of the of the earth. He created man and woman. And he said, Behold, it's all very good. Adam committed one sin. Thou shalt not eat of the tree. He ate of the tree. He committed one sin. How much power is in one sin? Because Adam committed one sin, every bird dies. Every fish dies. Everything that creeps upon the earth dies. The sun will be destroyed. The galaxies will roll up like a scroll, melt and dissolve and run from his face. And the earth will burn for him heat. That's the power of one sin. It destroyed the whole universe. God has to destroy the whole universe because Adam committed one sin. If you're saved in here today and you're in a backsliding condition or you ain't where you once thought you ought to be, I want you to know, don't beat yourself up. Because if you can lose your salvation, we lose it every day. Because it don't take one sin to lose it, it is possible to lose. Because one sin destroyed the whole universe. 
So if you're a Christian and you mess up, don't beat yourself up because I want to tell you something. If salvation can be lost, we lose it every day. The Bible says, where sin abound, grace did much more abound. What well, Adam did in the garden abounded to the destruction of everything that we see and know. But I want you to know what Jesus Christ did at the cross superabounded what Adam did. <coughs> I'm redeemed, praise God. Not back to the way Adam was. See, what is the effect of sin? Sickness, disease, pain, death. That's the effects of sin. What did Jesus do at the cross? Counteracted every one of them. We're going to have a body like in the young. It's going to have no sickness. It's going to have no pain. And it's going to be better than the body that Adam lost. Praise the Lord. What's the cure for sin? What's the cure for it? See, sin is what brings forth sickness, pain. It brings forth death. For the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What is the cure for sin? It's Christ Jesus. You can't go to heaven because you're a good person. Being a good person don't cure sin. You can't go to heaven because you gave him the offer plate. Put the money in the offer plate don't cure sin. You can't go to heaven because you're a good mom or a good dad or because you didn't rob a bank or murder somebody. That ain't no cure for sin. If you can cure sin by being a good person, I want you to know that Jesus left heaven's glory and died on the cross for absolutely no reason at all because you cured sin by your own good works. You're preaching. You're wasting his time coming and dying for you. You was already good. God put a seat up there with your name on it because you was good enough that you didn't need Jesus help. I don't know how you feel, but I feel like if I'm going to sit on the throne, it's going to be one that's got his name on it because he earned it for me. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's what he says in the book of Revelation. He that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I overcame him, sit with my father in his throne. I'm not going to sit in my own throne that I earned by my own works. I'm going to sit in the throne that he earned for me. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, For you're saved by grace, a free gift. Not, you're saved by grace through faith. That not of yourself. It's not of you that you're saved. It's of him. It's not what you've done. It's what he done. I want you to know when Adam sinned, he became a sinner. And everybody's born of Adam. You didn't lose yourself. Don't beat yourself up where I'm lost because I drank or I cussed. I'm lost because I took God's name in vain. I'm lost because I cheated on my wife. No, you're not lost because of that. You're lost because Adam was a sinner and you're his seed. But you're not going to be saved because you're a good person. You're lost because you was born lost in Adam. You're saved because you're born again. You're lost because you was born that way. And if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved because you're going to be born that way. Jesus said, Burly, burly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You must be born again. I was born the seed of Adam. But praise God, about 11 years ago when I asked Jesus in my heart, I was born by the seed of the Word of God. That's what it says in Peter 1 and 23, that we was born again not of corruptible seed, but in of incorruptible seed. By the word of God. Praise the Lord. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Why? Because he's born of God. 1 John 3 9. Praise the Lord. That's some good news, church. Yeah, you might have been no good. Yeah, you might have sinned. You might even sin uh, yesterday, even though you've been a Christian for 20 years, but I want you to know that's who you are in Adam, not who you are in Christ. In Christ you have no sin. Why? Because he's the cure. He's the cure. And he's the only cure. If you're in here today and you're a pretty good person, but you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, I want you to know you might as well be Adolf Hitler if you die today because you're going to hell. You're never going to get to heaven by being a good person. I watch this one show. It's called The Way of the Master. And it's got two Christian men that go out on the streets with microphones and they ask people, are you a Christian? And about 80% of them will say no. They say, well, you think you go to heaven when you die? And about 90% of them, 80% will say, yeah. And he say, well, why should God let you go to heaven if you're not a Christian? Well, I've never robbed nobody. I've never killed nobody. I'm a good person. Really? That's sad. That shows how bad the preaching is in America. Because everybody goes to a funeral. <laughs> Certainly the preachers need to be preaching on sin. You're not a bad person because of sin, though. You're a bad person because you reject the cross of Christ. You're a bad person because your father Adam was a sinner and you're his seed. It's like an apple seed to bring forth apple trees every time that they bring forth orange trees. Your 
father Adam was a sinner, and you was brought forth in sin. David said, Behold, I was shaken in sin, and iniquity did my mother conceive me. But praise the Lord, I was born again in righteousness, in holiness. The Bible says that I am now a partaker of divine nature. What does that mean? That means God lives inside me. Praise the Lord. My spirit that dwells inside of my heart is now made one with His spirit. He's the cure. What's the cure for sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. No other found I know. Praise the Lord. That makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 7 that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from what? All sin. And in verse 9, it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Has the blood of Jesus been applied to you? Think you did about the children of Israel. They've been enslaved to the Egyptians. The Egyptians had put them under hard bondage with rigor. But I want you to know that there was a little lamb slain. And blood went up on the side of the door of that house. And immediately, they were set free. They were no longer a slave to Egypt. From the time the blood of the lamb was applied to the house, Israel was not a slave to Egypt no more. I want you to know in Romans chapter 6, when you're lost, the Bible says you're a slave to sin. You can't be good. It's impossible. Don't try to be a good person when you come to Jesus. The Bible says when you're lost, you're a slave to sin. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ is our lamb. Whenever John was out baptized and he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the lamb of God. And what did the lamb do? He hung between the heaven and the earth. God sent you his only son. The hand between the heaven and the earth, why did she ever drop the blood in his body? And just like that blood that went up on the door of the Israel's house, as soon as it did, there was a slave no more. If you received the blood of Christ in your life, I want you to know you're not a slave to sin no more. You're no longer under the works of the devil. You have been set free, praise the Lord. Israel was set free from the Egyptians, and it said they spoiled the Egyptians. I want you to know that Satan will be spoiled the very second you ask Christ in your heart again. Praise the Lord. What is sin? It's transgression of the law. That's what Adam did. He disobeyed God. Where did it come from? It came from Satan. Satan imputed it that mankind into this world. What's the effects of it? Sin. The effects of sin is pain, suffering, a broken fellowship with God, and death. What's the cure? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The last question I ask you is, will sin be destroyed? Absolutely. I love this verse. I can quote it, but this is so much powerful, uh, more powerful if you just see for yourself. Colossians chapter 2. This is here's one that I'm going to show you a little bit of scripture on it. This is what Jesus did at the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, I want you to know these principalities and powers are evil spirits. They are fallen angels, and they are the devil. The Bible says if we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what he's talking about, spiritual wickedness here. Jesus has spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphant over them. He triumphed over sin that day. How? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For he who knew no sin was made sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. How did He try out sin? He took all your sin upon Him. And then Him and sin had it out for the dead. Praise the Lord. And whenever He died, sin died. And when He rose again, sin stayed dead. That's as simple as I know how to make it. Let me show you what it says in Romans 8.3. <clears throat> For what the law, the commandments of God, could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin. How? In the flesh. Christ took sin upon His flesh. The Bible says it pleased God to bruise Him. Why would it please God to bruise Jesus? Because Jesus was clothed in your sin. God is a holy God. He must punish sin. And the life that I told, God got to punish. The times I was drunk, taking God's name in vain, God got to punish that. But praise the Lord, Jesus took that up. And God saw me at the cross. And He punished my sin in the flesh of Jesus Christ. And whenever Christ died and sin was punished, I was set free. Then Christ rose again and He left sin in the grave. That's what it says. The sin that was condemning you, the sin that was taking you to hell, Jesus killed. He killed it at the cross. He 
You know, church, if we really knew who we was and what was done for us, man, it 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 it'd take some really terrible act to cause us to walk around and say that. We got so much to be happy about. Sin that was destroying us is gone. The devil who was our father <laughs> is no longer our father. Our, 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 our road that we was on that was on the highway to hell, he, he transferred it. You know how I like the train tracks? They transferred from one to the other. He transferred it. Now we're on the road to heaven. We have a seat in heaven. We have a crown in heaven. We have a home in heaven. We have a city in heaven made of pure gold. And we're going to dwell in heaven forever with God among the angels. We're going to be made new. When we leave this world that we love so much, it's then that we're going to be released from sin and from all wickedness. I want you to know you've got something to be excited about. There's no reason why a Christian should be saved. We've got a lot to be excited about. I'm forgiven. I'm at one with God. I'm perfect before God. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1 that Jesus Christ will present me before the Father without fault, without blemish. Praise the Lord. I don't got to do it. Jesus is going to take me and present me before God's throne without fault. Praise the Lord. What can make a man any happier to know every sin I ever done, I'm going to stand before God as if it never happened. Jesus was made Jew at the cross. He was made sin. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say it. For he who knew no sin was made sin. Jesus was made sin at the cross that you might be made righteous before the Father. He was made your body at the cross that you could be made His body for the church is the body of Jesus Christ. How does that make you feel, Brother Dempsey, to know you're a part of the body of Jesus Christ? How about you, Brother Daniel? How could you think I'm the body of Christ and then be unhappy? We do it. We're good at what we do. 1 John 3, 8, look what this says. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was manifested. That word manifested means made known. For this purpose, Jesus was made known that he might destroy the works of the devil. What's the works of the devil? Sin. What's the works of sin? Death. What did Jesus do? He destroyed. I want you to know you are free in Jesus Christ. 100% free from sin. 100% free from the devil. 100% free from hell. If you have Jesus Christ. If you have a reason to smile. If you have a reason to be happy. But you also have a reason to be motivated. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus Christ. Don't you want sin to be destroyed in their life? As it is in yours. I want you to know that Jesus destroyed sin. To all who come to the cross. You ain't, you ain't a robot. He ain't going to twist your arm and make you receive him. But he says, the Spirit says, come. The bride says, come. The Father says, come. Will you come? He says, follow me. Will you follow him? He's not going to twist your arm. The Bible says in John 1 and 12, to all who receive him, he gave power to become the sons of God to all who believe upon his name. How hard is your part? Receiving and believing. How hard was his part? Carrying the cross, being whipped, being pierced, being crucified, bearing all your sins and the judgment and the wrath of God of your sins. That was his part. What's your part? Simply receiving. Why would we turn away and risk our eternal soul in hell? Why would we turn away so great a salvation that we do nothing he done at all? People do it every day. I don't know why. Don't ever think you're a good person and you're going to get to heaven that way. Thank God, I have sinned. I was born in sin. I was born in sin with my father Adam. And except I be born in Jesus Christ and he become my new father. Sin and hell will always be part of who I am. But if I receive Jesus Christ, then sin will be destroyed. Look what it says. He destroyed the worst of the the works of the devil have been destroyed in your life. If you can get a hold of that, you're talking about feeling free. You know, you see people all the time and, and they're just always complaining. You want to know why? Because they don't realize that the devil's been destroyed out of their lives. Yeah, we might have little battles with the devil, but I'm here to tell you the war's done won. Praise the Lord. We, we, we start looking at all the little details and the little pictures. And the big picture we miss. The war's done won. You're already God. You're already forgiven. Sin has been destroyed in your life. You already have a home in heaven. And if you're here and you're lost today, don't think you've got to do some great thing. 
All you gotta do if he's touching your heart is say, Jesus, please forgive me, sinner, and tell him I'll die. That's how easy it is. Being there to love him, so that Christian life's a hard life, no, it ain't. It's the easiest life you ever live. You don't gotta do nothing, he done done it for you. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who's heavy laden, and I give you rest. For my yoke is easy. That's what Jesus said, it's easy. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you shall find rest for your weary soul. When you come to Jesus Christ and be a Christian, it ain't a hard life. You find rest for your soul. You might say, well, Christians are supposed to do all these good works. Guess what? I do all these good works not to save myself. I do all these good works not to keep myself saved. I do all these good works simply because I love Him, not one of them. He created a new person in me. The Bible says, for you saved by grace through faith, that not yourself is a gift to God, not of works, as he should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When I was born again, he created me to good works. I don't do them because I had to. I do them because that's just simply who he made me. Praise the Lord. Person that built a car, built a car to drive, not to plow a car. Well, when you get saved, He builds you to do good. Okay? You just do it because that's the way He builds you. Try to make it to where everybody understands. If God's touching your heart here today, I want you to know there's seven billion people. Think about that. Seven billion people on this planet. He's taking time right now to make you feel special. He's taking time right now to say, hey, I'm touching your heart. It's me and you right now. God's touching your heart for anything. Forget your job. Forget your family. Forget everything. Forget your four-wheeler, your motorcycle. Forget your house, your lawn. Forget everything. If God's touching your heart, it's you and Him right now. What we do. Forget everything. It's you and God. He's touching you. Will you receive Him to save you? If you're backslidden, will you rededicate? It's you and Him. He's taking His time to touch your heart right now. As Brother Danny comes, I'll give you an invitation. If God's touching your heart and you want to come up here in this church, be saved or rededicate. This is between you and the Lord. <coughs> You're welcome to do it. We gladly pray with you. We gladly welcome you. As the church stands, page 305, I have decided to follow you. <laughs>
know what I mean? It don't matter how much I talk about good I am or how much I lift myself up, it means nothing, brother. Your pride is good to nobody in the world. And you can't sell it for a nickel. It costs Satan to fall from heaven. Will it cause you or your loved ones to go to hell? Maybe. Swallow your pride if God's touching your heart. We're going to get ready for the baptism. I'm going to get dressed. You ready, brother? You get dressed? Or are you already dressed? Already dressed. Already dressed. <laughs> already dressed. Well, he's going to be waiting on me. I guess a little song back at first. That's the end. Thank you. Anybody? Anything on your mind or heart you want to say? It's not really. Go to page 135. That's about the blood. Just wait, get up on you, get the